Renly offered me a peach at our parlay, mocked me, defied me, threatened me, and offered me a peach. I thought he was drawing a blade and went for mine own. Was that his purpose? To make me show fear? Or was it one of his pointless jests? When he spoke of how sweet the peach was, did his words have some hidden meaning? The king gave a shake of his head like a dog shaking a rabbit to snap its neck. Only Renly could vex me so with a piece of fruit. He brought his doom on himself with his treason. But I did love him, Davos. I know that now. I swear I will go to my grave, thinking of my brother's peach. This is, of course, Stannis talking to Davos after he has used a shadow baby via Melisandre to assassinate his brother Renly. Now, when we go back to the scene where Renly offers Stannis the peach, this is what we see. You may well have the better claim, Stannis, but I still have the larger army. Renly's hand slid inside his cloak. Stannis saw and reached at once for the hilt of his sword, but before he could draw steel, his brother produced... a peach. Would you like one, brother? Renly asked, smiling. From Highgarden, you've never tasted anything so sweet, I promise you. He took a bite. Juice ran from the corner of his mouth. I did not come here to eat fruit. Stannis was fuming. My lords, Catelyn said, we ought to be hammering out the terms of an alliance, not trading taunts. A man should never refuse to taste a peach, Renly said as he tossed the stone away. He may never get the chance again. Life is short, Stannis. Remember what the Starks say. Winter is coming. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. I did not come here to be threatened either. So yes, as they are parlaying before Renly is assassinated, Renly offers Stannis a peach, which he refuses. Stannis afterwards is absolutely haunted by this moment, and by this peach, and for good reason. Now, peaches have a lot of symbolism behind them in mythology, often referring to health or happiness, and it is very clear in this scene that George R. R. Martin is using this peach to symbolize the sweetness of life that Stannis refuses to taste, but that Renly is taking full bites of. Renly is out there having tournaments, feasting, eating peaches, hanging with his friends and his bros, and Stannis is out there coldly preparing for war, he's in a loveless marriage, he doesn't really even seem to want to be king, He is just doing what is his duty and what he believes his duty is. Stannis refuses to slow down, taste the fruit, see the trees, eat a peach, and just relax and enjoy even one single moment in life, including the last time he will ever see his brother. He knows that there's a good chance this will be the last time he ever sees his brother, and he still refuses to even share a peach with him and have a little chat. Stannis is, in fact, all business, all the time, and he will not stop to take a bite of a peach. Peaches are also often used to symbolize long life or even immortality, but it is not really the mythological legends about peaches that this theory is based around. This is based right around some straight up George R. R. Martin in this universe magic. Now, if this is your first time on the channel, oh boy, do you have some fun videos to catch up on after this one, and make sure to subscribe while you're here, but one of the things that we have talked about quite a bit is the idea of guest right, which George has laid out some very clear rules for. If you share food or offer someone a place by your hearth, you are giving them guest right, which protects them for the night, and they are protected from you. It is essentially a binding contract in the same way an oath in front of the gods is a binding contract. Guest right is a built-in to the culture and into the world binding oath to not harm one another. Now, humans can, of course, break guest right in the way that we see Walder Frey break guest right at the Red Wedding, but this is considered an affront to the gods. The gods respect guest right. It is one of the most important traditions in the North, and in fact, in the story of the Rat Cook, we are told that he was not punished for murder. He was punished for breaking guest right, because that the gods cannot forgive. 
So there's pretty clear implication here that the gods themselves, if it were put to the test, would in fact have to follow guest right. It is one of the things that they cannot forgive, it is one of the things that they enforce, it is a thing that they themselves would follow. So all of those things are very well established in the text, and one of the things that we have talked about in other videos on the channel recently is the idea of these shadows and how they are created via shadow binding. And I won't go all the way down all of those rabbit holes, you can go check out the other videos, but I don't think it's an illogical leap to say that the gods are involved with making these shadows, even if Melisandre using fire magic to make her shadows is a bit different than some of the shadow binding that we have talked about in the series so far, which we believe could be related to the wall. And again, Melisandre, when she is at the wall, says the shadows she births here would be more powerful. Probably for good reason, probably because all of this shadow magic is generally connected and coming from roughly the same source. And so, if our conclusion that these shadows could in fact potentially be bound by guest right, because these shadows are basically from the gods themselves, well then all of a sudden, I think you can piece together an entirely new layer of tragedy that has just been added on to Renly's Peach. If Stannis had accepted the Peach, Renly would have been protected from the Shadow by guest right. He would have been protected overnight via guest right by sharing food with Stannis. I think it is a reasonable thing to suggest that the Shadow form of Stannis Baratheon would not have in fact been able to go and kill Renly that night, had he actually eaten Renly's peach. That's why he is going to be haunted by it for the rest of his life. That's why when he wonders about it, he wonders, did his words have some hidden meaning? Was there more to this peach than what Stannis can see? The answer is yes. It is a thing that could have, in some way, prevented the entire domino effect of Renly's death including the potential effects of kinslaying on Stannis himself. Now, I don't think this is necessarily something that we will ever get explicit confirmation of, but if we find out by the end of these books that these shadows can in fact be bound under guest right, potentially even by giving guest right to the person who is casting the shadows, then in fact, maybe you could have a situation where we look back rereading this scene and realizing, oh my god, if he would have just eaten the peach, he would never have killed Renly. And if he had never killed Renly, then he wouldn't have been a kinslayer, and he wouldn't have been cursed, and then he wouldn't have had this happen. You know, it might be one of those things where we look back at the domino effect of Stannis being unable to just slow down and eat the peach, and realize that, yeah, that is, in fact, Stannis's fatal flaw manifesting itself in a way that is going to, somewhere down the road, lead to his ultimate demise. It would be a very interesting way to have done that for George if he knew in the end that, yeah, that peach would have bound that shadow under guest right. And you do know George just loves to, like, layer his tragic meanings all on top of one another, so I really do think this would be a very good addition to the scene of Renly's Peach if we go back in hindsight and realize all of this is in fact the case. And, of course, let's not overlook the effect that Renly's death had on the entire realm, not just Stannis himself, because it is one of the most, like, talked about, I guess, what ifs in like the early story, right? Everyone loves to ask, oh, what if someone did this? What if someone did that? Well, what if Renly 1 has insane implications that just fall out through the rest of the story? Because Renly was totally willing to be bros with Rob Stark. He didn't really care what was going on. So you could have had Renly with all of Stannis's remaining bannermen after they defeated them. I don't know if they would have ever gone over. Seems like Renly would have welcomed anyone who would have came. They would have had the force to go beat Tywin, beat the Lannisters in King's Landing. Renly likely becomes the king, and then Rob is king in the north, and then the war is over, potentially? I mean, that's a pretty massive fallout, all coming from the fact that Stannis just didn't eat this peach. And we do also see that these shadows are, in fact, 
restricted in different ways by magic. So if you want a little bit more evidence that they could be bound by guest right, take account of the fact that they are bound outside of these castles by wards. So Davos needs to smuggle Melisandre in so she can birth the shadow baby within the ward so that then the assassination can take place. So these shadows are, like, in some ways, restricted by magic. So I think it would make sense if they were also restricted by guest right. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. If I had to try and debunk this theory myself, I would say the biggest plot hole in it is the idea that the shadow is able to kinslay, because kinslaying is also bad, just like breaking guest right, and the gods are supposed to not do that. So I think I could mark that as maybe the biggest piece of evidence in the text against this idea that this shadow would have actually been bound by guest right, but I really do think that it is a pretty strong case and would add a little bit of tragedy to the story. Also, while we are on the topic of shadows and guest right, for those of you who watched my last video, I do want to just throw out a quick clarification because I did misspeak a little bit on one of the points that I made about our boy Patchface. So, in my last video on the channel, I was talking about Patchface's song about shadows, and I said that the shadows had been universally agreed upon to mean the others. What I meant to get across was that it has been universally agreed upon Patchface knows and sings about the others, with his In the Dark, the Dead Are Dancing lines, and therefore, if you look at the others as shadows, which was the point that I was going into next, it does make a lot of sense that these would also be a potential reference to the others when he mentioned shadows. So that's all I meant, is that it has been agreed upon that Patchface knows about and sings about the others, and therefore it is reasonable, in my opinion, to assume the shadows he sings about could be the others, if the others, in fact, turn out to be shadows. So, little clarification from last video. Thank you again to those of you who make it to the end of these things, and I will see you all with something else very soon.